Good to see you, everyone. So I'm sorry for delay. I had to grab the beer. <laughs> so we have some new things for you. We have awesome guests today. You perhaps are wondering who is Boosted Boris from, from description. Boosted Boris, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. This is Boosted <laughs> Boris. Yes, uh, this is our first surprise. We want to break the traditional way that this tech events are done that are rather too focused. I mean, you can read that on the internet everywhere. We want to have fun, especially in this tough quarantine time. So we've been setting up pretty complicated thing here. So we would appreciate if you drop in comments, if you can see us well, if you can hear us well. Uh, there is a crazy delay on YouTube, something like 20 seconds. So I cannot really check what's happening right now in the broadcast because I'm, you know, 20 seconds ahead. So please, yeah, just just to complain if you cannot see us or if you cannot hear, hear us, especially Boosted Boris. That is the main part. And uh, now well, we have uh, many, many interesting topics to discuss today. And uh, I suppose that we start with uh, Lady First, with Spy Ladies and with Andrea. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining today. Tell us about the Pi Ladies. A uh, really, really short introduction. I guess I will represent Pi Boys here and I will just drop it right away. Are men allowed on Pi Ladies Meetup? <laughs> Thank you for that question. So, Anton, yes, men are allowed um, to the Pi Ladies meetups and other tech events under one condition. I will tell you more about this condition later, if it's okay. <laughs> well, okay, good. Uh, so, you are going to present us something today. Make a pitch. People have a hard choice. They all have stuff to do at home. They want to know if they even want to listen to this or not. Highlight, what are you going to talk about? Of course. So yeah, and now I, I will try to convince you that it is worth it to listen to us today instead of doing your laundry or whatever is expecting you at home right now. Um, all right, so the topic that I will be telling you about is how I was able to end up this, well, to get out of this quarantine whenever that's gonna be, or this lockdown, uh, with a master thesis and a master's degree in my hands, hopefully. Um, how I did it, what were the downs and the ups, I will let you know. Cool. I see some comments of Laisa. I had to show it, so thanks, Laisa. Uh, I need to say, Laisa is uh, the first organizer of Unify Ladies. And uh, maybe actually before we get started with the presentation, uh, I will just quickly uh, drop a greeting from her. What do you think, Andrea? Let's do it. Oh, yes, let's do it, definitely. All right. Good. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Laisa from Pi Ladies Munich Organizer. I just want to say hi and send some greetings from Portugal. Uh, I actually got locked down here and yeah came for vacation had to stay got the flight canceled decided to stay for personal reasons uh i hope everybody is, is somehow coping up with this time it's a very difficult time for everybody i guess being at home it's not such a nice thing but i also wish that you can come out of something good out of it uh, keep your mind strong and your body also physically well and, and i miss a lot to our meetups and I hope to see you all soon. Bye. Nice. Thank you, Laisa, for the nice greeting. A bit of background. Laisa is right now in Portugal. So she went there for her birthday. And guess what? Airports close on the way back. I, I think that's the right story. Yeah. I was feeling really sorry for her. I mean, we chatted a bit. Uh, then I realized she's in the Portugal, next to the beach. I asked, uh, are the beaches open? She says, yes, uh, everybody is allowed to go to the beach. The weather is perfect. So 
Yeah, we all feel really sad for you, Lisa, here in Munich, I suppose. <laughs> By the way, yeah, uh, if you're not from Munich, uh, write in comments. It's interesting to see who, who is joining today. Good, so now, as you know, the Pi Ladies gang, uh, I guess we give the word to uh, Andrea and you will show her the presentation, right? That's right. Thank you so much, Anton. So can I share the slides now with you? I'm really yes. eager to do this. Perfect. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, Anton already said a couple of things about me and I just want to thank you all for joining tonight and also uh, give you a few words about myself. My name is Andrea Maldonado and you can find me on Twitter here. Um, I'm a, a Pi Ladies Munich organizer together um, with Liza, Olga and Anton as well. And in, starting in May, I will be now a PhD student. So I'm really happy and excited for that. But now I will tell you a few more words about Pi Ladies Munich. So these are the organizers of Pi Ladies Munich, Laisa, Olga, Anton and myself. I go, Alto, um, Anton is more of a Pi Ladies master consultant, if I may say. And well, what do we do? Pi Ladies is a worldwide organization with um, up to 113 chapters. Pi Ladies Munich itself is active since July 2019. And here on the map, you can see some locations of Pi Ladies in different cities. And in Germany, we have Munich, Berlin, Hamburg, and Karlsruhe. So if there's any Pi Ladies from either of these cities or any place in the world joining us today, also drop us a line in the comments. We're very happy to have you here. All right, so mostly what we do at Pi Ladies Munich is um, organizing meetups and conferences. You can find us on social media as in the meetup page, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. There you see us with this Pi Ladies Munich name. So if you think this is a cool initiative and you would like to be part of that, you are very welcome to support us as well. Um, if you're a female, you can start your own chapter uh, or be an online now or offline uh, later speaker. If you're a male, you can also be our sponsor or after Corona offer to host um, an event for us. Also, you can encourage uh, staff to coach at events or participate in the Pi Ladies um, organization or Pi Ladies Munich chapter if this is your city of choice. All right. So more about Pi Ladies Munich. Um, we want to spread the word about beloved Python, the programming language. <laughs> Uh, all right, so for this, we do have a focus. We want to spread the word, uh, especially among our ladies. Um, we want to create a safe environment for beginners and especially for ladies. And for this reason, we do have, as Anton mentioned before, an attendee policy. If you are a male, you are allowed to come to all our tech events, given that you bring along a female companion with you. So why do we do this? It's because we don't want the, our meetups or our tech events to look like the picture here on the right side, where any lady might feel out of place. All right, so all in all, thank you so much. And I just want to welcome you to join our meetups. Um, here is how it normally looks offline. The first picture is from our last meetup in February, the last face-to-face -face meetup, that is, because since the lockdown, we have been also working on content to um, bring to your home online, as you can see on the picture in the middle as well. So that's it from us. Thank you so much. And I guess now back to Anton. I will stop my slide. Oh, this is nice. It feels cool. It feels new. So thanks for the introduction. And I have an answer to my question. So men are only allowed then if they bring a lady or if they are uh, speakers or if they are sponsors. So you can 
bring a lady or be a supporter. Although we also want to encourage more ladies to also get into this speaker's role themselves. So if you are a lady and you feel like you have any Python related topic or technology related topic that you would like to talk about, uh, please just drop us a line or reach out to any of the organizers. All right. So yeah, I, I need to ask this, uh, Andrea. You can only come if you bring a lady. So how exactly you're going to check that? Like you have a special person on the door. So asking like, all right, sh show what you got. Or how does it work? Well, we have you, right? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. We actually do not check that um, as regularly as you would uh, think. Um, we do respect whatever um, gender you identify yourself with. If you are coming along regularly and you do identify yourself as a male um, and you are looking a little bit like Anton <laughs> and we don't know your face yet as a supporter or speaker, we might ask you to bring uh, yeah, who you brought with you. So I uh, hope that answers your question. <laughs> and, and not only mine, that's the question yeah, that's I right. hear all the yeah, time. That's why I'm asking. All right, uh, then let's jump to the next topic. Please tell us, how does it work with the university at the time when you cannot leave your apartment? Will you present us something? Sure, so I will present you how I got um, to do my, yeah, my master and how I got my master's degree in the middle of these Corona times. So let me for that also share my screen again with you. So can you tell me, please, if you are able to see my screen? Yes, we are. All right. So my topic of today goes a little bit like um, loading. <laughs> Almost there, I hope. All right. So now you see my screen? Yes. Great. So this is the topic for me today. Or, well, maybe not love in times of Corona but more like master's degree completion in terms of Corona. So for this, I prepared a little story for you. This was me pre-coronavirus times, just hanging out in, at the university, um, yeah, having some large cup of coffee, some snacks, and writing my thesis. Then the coronavirus came along, and the words were to stay at home. So as I am a computer scientist, I thought, well, this is not too bad. I just go home. I will fill up uh, there my big cup of coffee. And then I can continue writing my thesis while getting lovely messages from my friends and family. Well, reality was a little bit different, though. With all this coronavirus crisis, uh, there, was, there were many um, distractions coming along. I was also thinking about, well, trying out new recipes, resuming some forgotten hobbies, any kind of activities but writing my master thesis. And this resulted in many late nights, uh, late nights where I was still working, listening to some cool music. Um, so I was disrespecting my schedules. For example, I maybe sleeping was not so important you know, more anymore. So turns out that not sleeping also reduces your cognition and then you start making some embarrassing typos for yourself. So, lucky for me, uh, after these stages of shock and denial of coronavirus, I was able to get into acceptance and uh, find my motivation um, due to the lovely messages of my friends to keep it up and then just get it done. So I was at some stage ready to just go out of this uh, lockdown with a master thesis in my hand. And I felt very powerful about this. Well, then also uh, the rest of my life complexity to do list um, stroke. For this, it was like three big mountains of stuff that I needed to, uh, to tackle. That's without counting the laundry. So first of all, I needed to decide about my next career step. Um, I also had a situation at home that I needed to solve. And then there was the category of like life as usual, I would say. So what I did is I uh, tried to split this 
big tasks into little ones, and then turns out I had lots of stuff to do. Um, in top of that, there were some dependencies um, that I will show you now in the example of the first um, one right here. So to decide the, about my next career step, I was applying to some jobs, then having some PhD and job interviews, which went well. So then I got to have a PhD contract. Turns out for this PhD contract, I had the dependence of um, I need to process my visa, right? And for the visa, I need to process, uh, I need to have a PhD contract. So I had a little loop over there. The same if I would have uh, applied to any or sign a job on any other job. Um, for the visa, I needed then also to process my passport. So that meant, yeah, going to Berlin. And all in all, um, I cannot start a PhD if I don't have this master's degree. So this was a little bit of the loops where I encountered myself. After many email exchange, talking to the university, to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here, um, to the embassy um, in Berlin and to everyone, well, I was lucky enough to get some letters and um, to get yeah, very kind people organized in order to finish um, also this big mountain of uh, steps. Um, not only the people from this, all these departments were very friendly and helpful to me, also I got nice help from my friends. In the middle of the master thesis, something um, that I wouldn't like to imagine uh, happened, I ran out of coffee. But I was lucky enough to have a nice friend that then uh, knocked on my door one day when, uh, when she found out about this and left a can of coffee for me to find. So that was already solved. Also, um, one of these days, my flatmate was super nice and decided to cook for me um, this delicious pizza that you can see on the right picture. So um, I also asked my flatmate, and I will be publishing the pizza as well in a little project that I have for myself that, I that you can check out here on the link below, that it's called Committed Meals, where I am trying to collect all information that I find interesting and delicious about different meals. All right, so all in all, I was able to submit my thesis and to defend it as well. So this was a happy end for me. Well, not quite the end though. Uh, for me, it, it is conclusive when I have some learnings that I can take away. So I'm gonna give you some of the three takeaways that I learned during this experience. And mostly it is about how to work, how to tackle when you have these kind of big projects um, at the door. And I will also be adding this to this repository of how I work that you can find on GitHub as well. Oh, that reminds me actually that I also wanted to show you the uh, commit meals repository in case you want to check it out. It looks a little bit like this. So yeah, feel free to also add any recipe or um, to read it and submit a pull request if you don't agree with anything. I'm very open to that. So going back to this, uh, the three takeaways. First, Techniques are friends. So what I learned during this um, during this time was challenge fragmentation. I was able to ta tackle these mountains of tasks by dividing them into more doable tasks and then subdividing them until they appeared uh, achievable for me. Other techniques that I used, and please just feel free to write any kind of question on the chat about this so we can talk about them later in detail, were Pomodoro technique, also having a matrix for the important, non-important, urgent and non-urgent, having a to-do inbox for my um, yeah, multi-threading thoughts between the Pomodoro technique periods, or well, a fancy way to say where somewhere to write my distractions down. And then I also were, was uh, using some kind of reinforcement loop to give myself some kind of reward um, and keep the feeling that I was achieving something. Furthermore, I also uh, developed a little technique for myself, uh, which I called an Agile for one, which was also uh, helpful. If you want to know more, please just drop your question on the chat and I will be happy to um, yeah, tell you more afterwards. So the second um, 
thing that I learned during this process is that you need to be open to negotiate your master plan, in my case, uh, with yourself. So you see here on the left side, this was one of the versions of my plan or the schedule when I wanted to have things finished. And with the Corona lockdown, with different dependencies, different things just coming and going, um, well, I don't know if you can see it there, but I actually used some liquid paper to be adapt this schedule, and this was not the first or last time for me. So that was that. And the third takeaway for me was to also remember to take um, enough and meaningful breaks and to also respect them. So don't remember to do the things that are important to you. Either uh, if it's yeah, eating, yoga, or also joining some cool meetups online. All right, so thank you very much. That's it from my side and back to you. Awesome. Thank you for the great talk, Andrea. Um, I'm just I'm just wondering how how did you block the way to to the kitchen to the coffee during your thesis? Like this is the hardest part to me. You mean the block the way as in like um, yeah building some kind of wall so my flatmates wouldn't steal my coffee or <laughs> what? <kind? laughs> no, to block yourself from going for coffee yet again and again. You can yeah. never have too much coffee. <laughs> right. So um, actually, I have my own policy about coffee. I don't want to drink more than three cups in a day, uh, no matter how stressed I am. So I was trying to keep it at one. Sometimes I did keep it at like two or, and I did reach three at some point during the, uh, the last um, yeah, during the last days of the master thesis. I don't know if I can say that I really took enough uh, breaks to sleep, especially on those days, but um, at all and all and at the end, it was great. I got it done and afterwards I was uh, also ready to do some home vacation myself. So <laughs> that worked out. All right. Good. Uh... Do we have any any questions and comments? Let's see. I see people say anytime, dear Andrea. I don't really know what's the context here, but it sounds so positive. I can tell you actually. So actually, that's the friend who dropped the coffee by <laughs> that knocked at my door ah, and left the ah. coffee for me uh, when she found out that I was uh, yeah that I got rid of coffee. So thank you so much again. The thesis wouldn't have been possible without you and the many more people that supported me. Uh, so thank you to all. <laughs> Good. Cool. All right. Uh, the plan is following. Uh, we will uh, have Andrea again at the end of today's session. And that's when we will all jump to a group call. Uh, we will have a Skype session. It's uh, up to 50, I think. That should be enough. Uh, where we all will be chatting at the end uh, together after the stream ends. But now we still have two great guests. So I think now, since there are no questions, so far at least, yeah, since there are no questions, we can say big thank you to Andrea. Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, Anton. <laughs> see you later. Yes, see you later. Cool. Boris, you are saving saving this show. <laughs> Does your mic work? Can you tell us something? Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes, <laughs> we can hear you. Right. That's great. So this is this is Boosted Boris, the magic drummer, the brutal developer who likes to hit the drums to let his stress out. Uh, Boris, why don't you tell something about yourself? Yeah, why not? So basically, I'm a software cloud architect. I'm working with Anton. And uh, here I'm uh, as a drummer and listener, but not as an architect. <laughs> but you will give us the talk eventually, right? That's Somewhere. right. Okay, yeah. because we are waiting. Imagine how cool could you do with drums when you know what you're talking about? You could do the epic talk. 
showing slides and driving at the same time. Simultaneously, yeah, I can do this. Can you so, can you type with one hand and uh, hear drums with another? Let's try it. Well, you have to have good hand separation as drummer, so it works. One hand. Mm -hmm. Why? Uh, I mean, we are already almost one hour, well, a bit less, uh, quite some time online. Let's give people uh, opportunity to get a beer or something and get a snack. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you will perform something. Would that work? Good. Then I will, I will say, uh, let's have a pause, five minutes or so. And meanwhile, uh, we will enjoy the solo uh, of uh, Boosted Boris and um, leaving you for five minutes. Now, a big applause for Boris. Bravo, 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 bravo. So thank you again a lot for your performance. I think everybody enjoyed it. At least Laisa did, she says, bravo. So bravo again. All right, uh, we know each other for quite some time. You've been on the meetup in Munich at JetBrains, I remember it was a talk so. It was a good yeah. one, people loved that it. Was, that was when we met, yeah. Uh, Paul, Paul Everett invited me to, to do uh, a webinar about talks, uh, which was also really nice. He's, you know, he's such a nice guy, and I'm, I'm really very afraid. Usually, of all this public talking thing, I'm getting used to it slowly. Yeah, yeah, that's when we met. Yeah. Do you remember then a trip to Ukraine to Kharkiv? That was a yeah. total accident. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. so nice. Yeah, that was yeah. fun. So, uh, for, for our viewers, uh, I, I'm sitting on the plane flying to Kharkiv, Ukraine to Python conference, and I see uh, in the three seats before me a very familiar hair, let's say, in the headphones. Yes. I'm thinking, <laughs> <Here they are. laughs> could, could that be Oliver? 
And it was Oliver, yeah, also flying to the same conference. I mean, Kharkiv, Ukraine is not the most typical place you usually go for a Python conference. That's why I, I was surprised. Uh, by the way, Boosted Boris is from Kharkiv. Ah, okay. Were you on the yes. conference also, Boris? Or you weren't in, in the area then? Uh, I don't think so. It is muted, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, I will show, I have, a, I have a picture. I will show it. Uh, so that's... That's us. Uh, you yeah. see, in, uh, in front of that stadium where we in where front we have of the stadium. Yes, because yeah. we were told that this talk is going to be on the Metalist Stadium, uh, this this conference. So of course, when somebody says you're talking on a stadium, you imagine it at least something like this. Well, that was <laughs> what I was personally expecting. Yeah, like, that's what it was like. This. At least my talk. <laughs> well, maybe like this. That would also work. Oh, look nice. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Turned out they have a smaller conference room for this style. Well, it was still a good conference. I loved it. Yeah. But the the room where I was, uh, that was really cool also. That was the, the VIP lounge. It was a bit smaller, but in the back there was uh, a big, big window where you could see then inside of the stadium. Uh, so that was, was a really cool uh, atmosphere in there. All right. So I remember that back then people were talking very good things about your talk so we are all thrilled to hear what they're going to share with us today so uh, i'm i'm giving uh, python courses testing with pytest and talks um, that's one kind of course i give but i also started teaching uh, yeah, basically about uh, the the fundamentals of of python uh, you know really like a deep dive how things really work and uh, at the end of these courses or also in between i like to show things um how you can you know do how you can surprise yourself with basically so it's it that wasn't really a, a finished presentation or anything but i just you know pulled it all together and tried to make some kind of uh about half hour presentation about it uh how to shoot yourself uh in the foot with python and how i managed to shoot myself in the foot with python over the years Cool. Uh, then let's get started. Okay. Uh, let me move over that screen first. Nice. But I'm. <laughs> okay. So can you see my screen now? Yes, gotcha. Okay. Good. But you can't see my mouse cursor moving around. Unfortunately not. Okay, good then. But you can see this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, then let's do it like this. Okay. So yeah, gotcha. And or how to shoot yourself in the foot with Python. Um, there's this old, old uh, kind of folklore in the programming world that people make jokes about how to shoot yourself in the foot with different programming language. This, I think that goes back into like the Usenet times. Uh, and there's many, many pages out there. Uh, you can search for yourself if you're interested in weird jokes about progress programming languages. There's, for example, JavaScript. You're, you've perfected a robust, rich user experience for shooting yourself in the foot. You then find that bullets are disabled on your gun. Or my favorite one for Python is you try to shoot yourself in the foot, but you just keep hitting the white space between your toes. And there's many more about this. So. This, for example, is from some self-confessed nerd called the Almighty Guru. And over the years, I found, sadly, very, very many ways I shot myself in the foot with Python. Uh, so let's just have a look at a few of them. Um, it's usually the little things in programming languages that can make a very big difference. Uh, one thing, for example, is if you have a string foot and you want to capitalize it and all of a sudden you get an attribute error, tuple object has no attribute upper. Um, I mean, as you're all primed and you know, looking very carefully, I guess you saw this little thing here at the end of the string, but just imagine you're like, have this in a, in a big pile of uh, code uh, and uh, you have some kind of error in your, in your system and you have this attribute error, tuple object has no attribute upper for something where you're sure it must be a string. But what actually happened is you just were lazy as I am and copy pasted some string out of a list and you forgot to get rid of the comma. 
And that is basically the tuple operator. So that creates a tuple with one element in it from that string. Um, yeah, so you have shot yourself in the foot successfully for the first time. That was that really happened to me in, in some huge pile of code where I was really riddling for hours how this is even possible. So I will never forget that. That's the classic copy and paste error. So that was the first thing. Uh, then, yeah, that's what I call keeping it fresh. Um, I don't know if, if you all know Python Tutor. Let me just switch off um, maybe my ad blocker quickly, let you see what this is actually looks like. So this is pythontutor.com. That's a really great tool how you can visualize execution of programs, not just Python, but uh, all kinds of other languages. Uh, I'm using that for many years now to show how things work. Uh, it's usually better than to make a knot in your tongue and try to explain uh, how things work. So that's what we're going to use to look at what really happens. So here on the left is the code, and there you see, and there's only two things, and that's important. There's just frames, which is the call stack, basically, where uh, the, the function objects are on and what is on the call stack at any given point in time. And then on the right side, there are the objects, and there's just one object space. So there is, is no separation. Uh, there's, if you come from Java, there's basically, there's just the heap. Uh, there's no stack as such for values. So and if I create, if I run this code, and you can think about it, I run a, a Python module here. So if I run this, this first line, it's actually, it got executed because creating a function in Python is not uh, like you would think maybe in, in C or something, some kind of definition that does something strange. No, it's just executable code. Def is a statement. So now you have a function object. So I created this function object and it's my global frame, which is, you can think of uh, in my module. And here, that is already looking a bit strange. So I have a default argument here, and I want this to be an empty list. So basically, what I wanted to do is I wanted to have a fresh list every time I call this function and then do something with it and return this fresh list. But this already looks a bit strange. And if I call this now, append to a list, you see, a, it's actually this list that seems to be connected to this function that gets manipulated. And if I get it back, I get that function back. So I didn't I didn't uh, that get that list from the function back. So I don't get a fresh list. And if I do that again, I added another element to that list. So uh, it, that's that's like the difference between assuming how the programming language work works you're working with and how it actually works. And this is something uh, I have been in long discussions with people about uh, basically them telling me that Python shouldn't work that way and me trying to explain that, yeah, okay, but <laughs> Python works that way, I'm sorry. Uh, so ba basically it's a natural side effect of this uh, fact that if you create a function object in the object space and this function object has a default argument, well, that has to live somewhere. So it has to be in some kind of it has to be attached to something and is attached actually to that function object. And um, as you've seen here, this is the only list I actually grabbed from my func, that's this uh, this object, the dunder defaults, which is an, an inbuilt attribute, which ke keeps all the default values, which is a, it's a tuple. And the first is this list. So I can access this also over uh, over this access. Oh, I have to mark it. Sorry, I'm pointing around here and you don't see. I have to not forget. So, so and then there is only one list object. And this, um, ha, I can actually say this never happened to me because I read about it and I found this so weird that I never forgot it. But I got called by by some some other team and they they thought, you know, they they looked for this error for hours and hours and then asked me if I can have a look. And it was exactly this problem. So this is something very uh, common, how to shoot yourself in the foot if you want to have a fresh object every time. Um, I think I'll pull this over here. So, and if you want to do it right, that's basically very simple. You have, you don't attach an object here. 
Instead, if you don't get a list here, then you create a fresh list. And that might also look a bit uh, strange to some people. Um, that is also a natural side effect of if you connect, uh, if you do a, a Boolean check in, in Python with OR uh, or with AND, then you don't get a Boolean back. You get actually the first object back that makes, um, uh, that satisfies the condition or that basically you have shortcut um, expression handling. So if this is true, if this is a list, if this is not empty, then I will assign this to that and otherwise I will assign an empty list to it. So this this way I can have a fresh list uh, every time. Let's execute that to see. So a list is not another list in this case. Yeah, I mean, I thought at least I show you how to not shoot yourself in the foot also. Uh, yeah, and that's that's something that bit me really hard um, when we switched libraries. We had our um, I, there was a time when I was really wishing for the standard library to have a path object. So paths shouldn't be strings, in my uh, opinion. They are objects you you deal with differently. So we had our own path handling uh, library for a while in our internal code, and then I think it was in Python 3.4. Uh, the path lib was introduced in the standard library. So we thought, whoo, every new um, project we start now, we use the standard library. We don't use our own self-built stuff anymore. And the first few times when I was working with it, something like this happened to me. I created some path and I wanted to check if it exists. And this path definitely does not exist. But if I execute this, uh, I end up in the true branch. So although this path definitely doesn't exist, it looks like it exists. Um, well, I wish you could uh, tell me now if you uh, if you think you know what it is, but I can't hear you, so I will just show you. Um, if you look at what this is, this is actually a bound method that would give me the result if I call it. And a method or a function is always true. So this is always true. And as that, that is a classic uh, problem of well, let's call it API design. Um, in my opinion, uh, exists should be an attribute on the path. Uh, it, 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 you know, it is an attribute of the path. So in our path library, this was an attribute which was Im implemented like with a property so that it gets refreshed every time you ask for it, but it looked like a normal attribute. And in pathlib, it's a function. So, hmm. I should have done it that way and that I learned that the hard way also. So what else do we have? Um, scary things are lurking in the shadows. Um, basically, uh, that's also something that surprises a lot of people when they, I mean, that's, that's basically all I, I learned about this after successfully having written a lot of Python programs for years and years uh, without ever running into this until I started try to start writing automated tests and try to start mocking things. And uh, that's and mocking things. If you, if you have, haven't heard this yet, uh, this, this term is basically to take things away and replace them with something else during tests to uh, to have to be able to test something better. So for example, some third party library that makes a network connection. You don't want this to happen while you're writing your unit test. So you try to mock that away. So replace it with some dummy function or so. And here in the example, I import uh, the, the operator module from the standard library and import the add and the sub functions that I can, can use to, to do functional programming with operators. And I try to replace that then for a test. So I import this, I have the add and the sub, and they're here. And this is might be a bit misleading. Let me just show you quickly how this is in, in uh, Python Tutor. So actually the correct way to show this would be this render all objects on the heap. That is what it actually looks like. So, but that gets a bit, yeah, no. That's that's okay. Let's do it that way. So now I have add and I have sub and I have my original add, which points to the same. So and they are the same. And if I use it in a functional way and add something, I get a 20. 
and then I just replace add with sub. And then I expect this to sub subtract instead of add. And this won't work because, yeah, that is the scary things that lurking in the shadows. So this is basically a question of shadowing something. So here, when I import this name, I create a new name in, in this namespace. Uh, let's let this, this module, for example. So this, this add, yes, it is that object in the moment I import it, as, as we can see here. Um, but as soon as I um, assign an, a different object to it, I create a new name in this namespace that shadows the name. So it's not it's not the object, it's not the thing that I can assign to here. It's a new name I create that just looks like what I imported. It's the same name, but the add inside my operator module is still containing the old object. So, and this is why this approach doesn't work. And especially when you're trying to run uh, automatic tests, you will have these kind of surprises. And if you want to read more about this, this topic, I mean, I can only scratch the surface here with these things uh, because I want to give you a few examples at least. Uh, but if you want to read up a bit more about this, this article from Ned Batchelder is really good, why your mock doesn't work. And just to show you with this shadowing a bit more uh, how this works, you can also do this with, with the inbuilt print function. Um, so this works as it should and now that is not true. <laughs> okay, uh, let's discuss this afterwards. Um, so print, I assign, uh, I assign uh, just something else to to the print function, and you know people might always al already think that's not possible, but it is. Nothing bad happens if I do this. So if I try to use the print function, then uh, I get a type error because the int object, which this print is pointing to now, uh, yeah, this is distracting me. I have to, yeah. Um, the, the int object is not callable because this is an int now. So I was actually able to, to uh, assign a new object to print. And if I want to make this work again, I can just delete this name that is shadowing uh, the, the print function. And why this is shadowing here is because print is automatically mapped into the namespace when uh, the Python interpreter starts up. There's a built-in module which, which is mapped into the, the, the namespace and the print function is in there. So if I delete this again, this name, then I have my print function back. Yeah. So that is um, shadowing things. It's also something really important to be aware of it. That also happens on, on a lot of different levels. Um, if we have enough time, uh, Anton, you will stop me if I'm going on for too long. I have no idea how long this will take. I di really didn't check it. I just uh, put some things together. And if I talk for two hours, everybody's gonna be, be asleep. Um, so the next thing is, from Python import surprise, uh, which is at least it surprised me once very, very uh, badly. So I have uh, I have my cool program here, which is do isn't doing very much. It is just importing platform and it's importing sys and it's printing out the platform, the result of the platform function and uh, the sys path and what this is. And if this looks strange to you, all this, F strings were introduced in Python 3.6, which means that you can um, you can write a string this way. You can have these curly braces, and everything in these curly braces gets evaluated. So this code gets evaluated, and the string representation of the result will be printed. And this little equal sign was added in Python 3.8, which means that it actually also shows the expression that you printed. So that's really handy for, for debugging or yeah, like showing things like this. So if I execute this, um, it looks like this. So this is the expression that's being evaluated and you might uh, see already that that can't be true 
because I don't think I'm running on a Commodore 64 at the moment, but that seems what a platform seems to think. And if I look at now what this actually is, the platform module is not what I would expect. It's a, it's actually lying next to that module uh, that I'm shooting here. So I'm here importing modules, uh, and that is just lying next to it. And that is also that is the, is another example for what you would could call a shadowing. And if you look at this path, you see the reason why. The first element, if I call a script like this with Python and then the, the path to the uh, module, then the first element in that path is always that directory. So if there is a platform.py lying in that directory, like it is in this case, well, then that's what found and that's what, what's important. And that's That might not be what I want. It pretty surely most of the time isn't what I want. So that is the, the contents of that platform module that lies there. Um, then if, if, you, if you run into that problem, um, that means that basically you're, you're running your, your code as Python files, uh, so not a real package. So then you might start doing things like this. Uh, you manipulate the paths to get rid of whatever is in the way. So I'm here iterating over the path uh, objects and getting rid of everything that starts with naive. So because that then this path is not in there and then I import the platform and then it works. So now I'm actually seeing what platform I'm really on. And that's the less naive approach because basically if you're in a point that you, you have problems like that and you have to do things like that, that is like the biggest alarm sign, at least for me, that uh, you missed the train to create a proper pa package. So let's do that quickly. Let's create a package. So now I'm in another folder like that. So I, I created a, a folder with a dunder init pi, which means this is a package. I put my program in there and I renamed it a little bit because dashes are not importable. You need a valid identifier to be able to import this. And my platform pi is still there. And I have a setup pi. Um, so program still looks like this. Uh, platform pi still looks like that. And setup pi looks like that. So all, all I all I need to do is create this little structure and have very little code in the setup pi. I need a name for my package. Uh, I need a list of the packages. I want to be part of the packages. And as I'm lazy, I just import find packages from setup tools, which then will look for the packages that are in that folder. And then if I want to have a command line tool, I can have an entry point that points to a console script entry point, which will create this command line tool that will be part of my uh, on, on the will be accessible in the command line if that is installed. And this points to what it should be run. So the main function in my cool proc package. If I want to make this work, I can create a new virtual environment. Oh God, that is such a horrible keyword. Uh, so there's nothing in there. And if I install this now, so I install this edit editable, I could also write this one. That means that the code is not copied in there, but it's, it's mapped in there, but it doesn't really matter how you do that at the moment. And if I output this, then I imported my I, might, I installed my package correctly. And now I have a command line tool called my cool program, which I can execute, which then will do the right thing by default, because the, the advantage the advantage that you have now that will protect you from things like that happening is now you have a proper namespace again. 
you have your package namespace. And if you want to uh, Im import your own platform pie, if you insist on naming things like things from the standard library, which one might think is not a good idea, um, I can still import it, but I need it uh, to access it whether via the package namespace. So if we look at this, so here from my cool package import platform, and I have to import that un under a different name. I won't go into the details of that, but you get another really interesting error if you just try to import it as platform, which has to do with, um, yeah, I'm not going, and I won't getting be getting into that. That would be too long. So just trust me on this one. You have to import it under a different name, and then you can access it via the, the namespace and access the original function from that you defined yourself. Yeah. So and the namespaces that I just mentioned. Uh, if you look at the Zen of Python, the last one is namespaces are one honking great idea. Let's do more of those. And I very much agree with that sentiment. Yeah. Um, Anton, how, how are we doing on time? Because I just see on my little marker here that I'm about halfway through. Well, we should be rather on the ending side. Sorry? Should be rather on the finish line. Okay. Then um, let's have a look what uh, what is there still. Now I think I, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this one and then then wrap it up for today, because that is uh, is, is also a security risk that one should be aware about, uh, and also like a little warning that you shouldn't you shouldn't even trust Python too much, and you shouldn't also trust maybe the documentation too much, because if you look at um, temp file mks temp so the temp file module gives you a, a possibility to create temporary files quickly uh, and easily and the documentation of that is you can add a suffix and a prefix and a special dir and the documentation says if suffix is specified the file name will end with that suffix otherwise there will be no suffix if prefix is specified the file name will begin with that prefix otherwise the default prefix is used if dir is specified, the file will be created in that directory. Otherwise, a default directory is used. So if you read this, to me, it means um, that this path cannot be clobbered by a directory traversal attempt. If I set a suffix and a prefix, so if I set a prefix, it shouldn't be possible that if I set a suffix, I mean, if you don't know, directory traversal means you, you as an evil attacker pass in some kind of string that uh, contains commands to switch directories out of the safe directory where you actually want to write your things. Um, so this shouldn't be possible if you read the, the documentation. But if you look at this, so I'm setting as a suffix, this, this is like the classic directory traversal. I'm trying to go up, 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 up. And on the Linux system, I try to access the et cetera shadow file. And then I set a prefix and I set a temp dir, and it shouldn't be this. But if I execute this on a Linux system, most POSIX based systems, they don't let this happen. So they throw an error. So there it would be just crashing. But this is actually the path. And if I create an absolute path of that, that would mean it would end up being uh, etc. shadow. So that is what happens on Linux. It just crashes. It's annoying, it, but it's not a security risk. But on Windows, it is a security risk. It works on, on Windows. And it's also not fixed yet, that problem. So that bug is open. And there's a discussion about it, how to go about it. Um, I, I, I thought uh, that maybe um, at least the the documentation might also should be updated. So if the if the code is still not patched in older Python versions, there should be maybe a big fat warning about this. Yeah, but this is still in the works. And at the moment, this is an open problem. And if you look at the source code, it's quite obvious why that happens. So that's the shared code from MKS temp temporary file and name temporary file. 
it's just doing an S OSPath join over this, and OSPath join is just completely done. So if you have an absolute path on the right side, uh, then it will just cover the whole thing and give you an absolute path. Yeah, so always aggressively sanitize user inputs. If something comes from the outside, don't just trust the functions you pass things in, sanitize it yourself. It's like in times of Corona, always wash your hands. That's the programming uh, version of that. And okay, as Anton told me, we are running out of time slowly. I'm jumping over the last few examples, maybe another time if you liked it. And oh, but yeah. Like what Andrea said also, I want to give you some takeaways. So how not to shoot yourself in the foot with Python. Always question your own assumptions, especially about the little things. I showed you a lot of little things which might be very innocent, but if you get them wrong, bad things happen and you should know how things work. And to, to be able to figure that out, you can make small experiments just like I showed you there uh, today and visualize what's happening with Python Tutor. That is, was really helpful for me also to figure out how things really work under the hood. Um, and then, yeah, in production code, use all the static code analysis tools you can get because mo most of those problems are pointed out by modern static code analysis tools like Flake 8 uh, with Flake 8 bugbear plugin and things like that. Uh, and yes, obviously, write automatic tests, write uh, code to exercise your code to see if it actually does in all kinds of corner cases what you think it does. And then you might shoot yourself in the foot less than I managed to do over the last few years. Yeah, so thanks for listening. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, um, I have a web page, first name, last name, DE about, and we are looking for a colleague, actually. My team is looking for somebody. So if you want to work with me and you're into um, Python and devops -y things, doing things in the cloud, and you want to build internal tools to help your colleagues um, have more fun doing machine learning uh, research, um, yeah, then get in touch. Um, the QR code is, is the short link for that. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. Bravo. I can hear Andrea as well. So uh, let's jump back. Good. Yeah. So uh, I'm showing you a link by Munich from Skype. This is uh, where this call uh, of us uh, presenters is. And now everybody is allowed to jump in. in 20 seconds or so, because now we are finishing the meetup part and we will be happy to see you in person there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before, before. Uh, I guess that's that's Alexander joining. Yeah, nice. <laughs> well, good to see you, Alexander, in front of LMU. <laughs> I'm warning you that this session is not showing more than four people, I think, at the same time. So wait a couple of, uh, a couple of uh, seconds more when we end this uh, broadcast and then uh, it, it will be cool to see everyone. I just wanted to say thanks to our speakers, to wonderful Andrea, to awesome Oliver, and of course to very, very boosted Boris. I didn't have time to chat with Boris much because he was too busy with drums. Uh, I want to still say that he has uh, a blog where he's posting uh, cool things about music and about technology. Uh, I will post the link to this blog uh, in comments here later. And I think you can see him on the next show. We will make more uh, in-depth interview. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining us again. And uh, yeah, as long as the lockdown is happening, I think we are all a bit missing the community part. So I guess we will have another session in a couple of weeks or so. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. I see you in Skype now. That was great. And right. thank you and Anton for making this possible and organizing as well as by Munich. This is no really problems. cool. All right. See you. Thanks again. Bye-bye.